actually wasn't actually doing extractions and watching live at the exact same moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was like, <laughs> I would totally mess everything up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, let's keep track of which extractions those are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're live now on the YouTube feed and on Google Hangouts. If you're watching us and doing your DNA extractions, <clears throat> Mike, um, you might you can join us directly using the links on the website or the links that got tweeted. Um, so today we're very excited to bring to you Julie Meyer, who is going to tell us about microbes and coral disease. And just uh, Julie's mentioned that she'll probably go right through her talk. And so please, if you have questions. Uh, put them through Twitter to microseminar, and we can get to them after she's done speaking. And so Julie is a proud graduate of the building I'm at right now, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, she had finished before I got here, but uh, a graduate of UD for her PhD, and then had done postdoctoral work at Marine Biological Laboratory, and is now at University of Florida and working as a postdoc researcher on coral disease. And so we are going to hear from her today, and I will mute everyone else's mics. And Julie, please share screen and uh, take it away. OK. Well, thank you all for tuning in, especially with the, um, uh, t the date change, as I'm getting my screen here up and running. Oh, come on. Just, uh, okay, hopefully you can see this. Can you see this? <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you no. today. Can you see it? So we just see the actual PowerPoint slide. Can you, can you, are you seeing your slideshow somewhere? I'm, I'm seeing the slideshow. Hmm, we're not. Mm. <laughs> okay. Can you try to share, because it gives you when you share a screen. You only have one screen though, right? Right. I can see it, Jen. Oh, okay. Oh. Then I'm just having it. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. If you can see this, okay. Let's try it okay, again. Why don't I try my desktop then? Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. So thank you for tuning in after the date change. I'm very excited to be talking about um, the work that I'm writing up now. Um, actually, there was a bit of a challenge putting together this talk because. I have so much data that's not going into one, one talk or one paper, so um, it was a, a new challenge for me to figure out how to tell a, a shorter subset of the data. Um, but I'm looking at coral microbiomes, um, the interactions of microbes within the surface microbiome of corals, and how that relates to um, coral diseases. So first, just I want to start off with a little bit about coral anatomy, um, so that we're all on the same page. We've got a schematic here of um, a coral polyp, and they have a two-layer body plan. On the outer surface, they have a, an epithelial layer that has mucus secreting cells, um, and then they have an inner gastric layer where the zooxanthellae or the symbiotic algae are, um, are actually intracellular in the, the gastric layer. They have tentacles with stinging cells that they can bring food into their mouth. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about the mucus layer. Um, so in this, in this uh, left-hand picture, you can see a coral that is, um, as part of an experiment, um, being agitated. And so a lot of this coral mucus is just um, sloughing off and coming off in strings. And if you've ever snorkeled, you might have touched a, a coral and felt it. Um, you know, there's, it's clear, but it's a very slimy, um, thick layer of varying thickness. Um, the symbiotic algae are actually what give the coral their colors. That actually, so all of this brown um, that you see is from the, the algae itself and not from the coral tissue. Um, one of the things that you can see on the right hand side are these little striations. It's actually these ciliated ridges um, that the coral itself can use to move this mucus along the surface. And they can move it in like a sheet and they can do it pretty um, dynamically. And so this is um, a very dynamic. Um, constantly changing mucus layer. It's not unlike our own um, gut where we have a mucus layer and cilia to move things around. Um, for the purpose of the coral, there is um, this mucus serves lots of, serves, lots of purposes. 
first of all, they only have a, a body plan with one way in and one way out of their mouth, and so they use the mucus to, um, especially moving the mucus to move particles into their mouth and wastes away. Um, and then they also use it to prevent settling of different detritus and other organisms that would compete for their, um, their space on a sunlit um, coral reef. Um, but this mucus layer also provides um, a substrate for a dynamic microbial community. And it's actually very um, <clears throat> pretty dense amount of bacteria, mostly bacteria, a little bit of archaea, a little bit of viruses, um, some uh, different eukaryotes can live in this mucus layer. And the, cor the carbon that is um, fixed by the symbiotic algae provides the carbon that the coral host then uses to um, make this mucus layer. And um, this microbial community provides services back to the host in keeping out pathogens that are um, in the water column that would normally try to um, invade any, at any opportunity, because this is a relatively rich environment. So these are heterotrophs um, that are mostly dominated by proteobacteria and especially gamma proteobacteria. They're known to produce antibiotics and interfere with quorum sensing. Um, so that they, um, again, provide uh, protection of, of the coral host from potential pathogens. And then a small proportion of the community is also capable of fixing nitrogen, and these are usually alpha proteobacteria. And we do know that there are bacteria that live in the coral tissue itself, as well as in the mucus layer, but there are far more um, microbial, there's a lot more bio biomass um, in the surface mucus layer rather than inside the tissues. So we kind of have this circle going on where the, um, the coral animal um, hosts these symbiotic algae. The symbiotic algae provide excess, um, excess carbon that the host turns into mucus that supports this microbial layer that provides nitrogen back to the nitrogen-limited algae. So it's a very um, dynamic holobiont. Everybody's working together. Um, but sometimes things don't quite work. And this is when we see coral diseases. And in particular, um, actually if I can go back for a second, when um, um, a coral is, is stressed by something like um, increasing water temperatures, UV radiation, pollution, all kinds of things, um, they can expel these symbiotic algae. So they don't need them um, to be there all the time, but if you can imagine, if you then you don't have that excess carbon to make that mucus layer to support um, the healthy bacteria in the microbiome layer. Um, and so you might have the opportunity for these um, pathogens to come in. And I do want to distinguish between coral disease and coral syndromes. Um, most of what we call a disease in corals are actually syndromes, I mean in a collection of symptoms, um, but we don't know what the pathogen is. And there are about 20 or 30 different um, syndromes or illnesses we've observed in corals, um, but you don't know um, what, what's causing it. A handful, as you can see here, that have known pathogens. Um, but again, a lot of these things happen after a coral has been bleached and is more susceptible to disease. So is it that these are primary pathogens or are they opportunistic pathogens where the coral host has already undergone some kind of physiological stress? Um, maybe it's expelled its, its algae, maybe it hasn't. Um, maybe it's just done something that's disrupt that, disrupted that native um, microbiome that would otherwise keep um, other th things like serratia and vibrio out of there. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about um, black band disease, and you can see why it's named um, as such, because it has a very distinct black band. Sometimes this can be dark purple or maroon. Um, on this side we have the uh, coral that's healthy, the healthy coral tissue. We've got the distinct um, black band disease. And then there's a little thin layer of exposed skeleton, but you can see as soon as that skeleton is exposed that these turf algae move in and colonize the, the dead coral. Um, black band disease is actually the um, first coral disease we've ever described in the early 70s, um, in, mostly in Belize and Florida. Um, since then, we've documented it around the world in, in many different species of corals. And um, what we do know about it is that it is dominated by this filamentous cyanobacterium. 
And for a long time, um, we described this as a polymicrobial con disease consortium, um, knowing that this filamentous algae is what's making the, the characteristic color, um, but it seemed to be accompanied by other um, potentially pathogenic um, organisms that are diff distinct from the healthy microbiome. Um, but recent studies have shown that, in fact, um, this cyanobacterium, and we are now calling it Roseophyllum as the, the genus. It's also been it's been previously called pseudo pseudo oscillatoria and oscillatoria. Um, if you classify this with green genes, it comes up as leptolingbia. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to just call it Roseophyllum. Um, but we know that. If you take roseophyllum filaments and you try to infect a coral, a healthy coral, you have to do a couple things. Usually the, it progresses a lot faster if you introduce the whole consortium and not just roseophyllum, which is hard to isolate anyway. Um, <clears throat> and you also have to score the surface. You have to damage that tissue in some way. Um, and studies have shown that, um, that potentially um, grazing fish that nick the uh, surface of the coral could be spreading things like these filamentous cyanos between different corals and spreading the disease because they're introducing an injury um, and then they're also carrying that cyanobacterium with them. Um, we know that black band disease increases um, in progression. It, it progresses faster and increases in prevalence um, during the warmer months of the year. Um, <clears throat> And the study, the, the samples that I'm going to be talking about are mostly from Belize and the Florida Keys, um, but I do have a handful from Honduras and a couple from Guam. And I put this picture in here. This is a Orbicella annularis from um, Belize, and most of the, the corals that I talk about today are about are these uh, boulder corals belonging to Orbicella or Montastria. Um, but I put this picture in here to remind me that to tell you that I have um, tagged samples that we sampled over time. So actually before I do that, <laughs> um, and I have both microbiome um, diversity studies, so looking at the community structure, and I also have a little bit of metagenomic data that I'll show today. So if we look at what's the basic bacterial community structure, and just looking at bacteria um, using Illumina, HiSeq, excuse me, Illumina, MySeq, and looking at the V6 region um, for phylogenetic purposes. And I can you know, go into details about that later if you're interested. But if we look at the basic community structure, we see that there's a very distinct, stable, healthy microbiome, regardless of location um, and, and regardless of coral host. And then the black band community is much more variable. And that's here in red. And in, and in fact, I have these six samples that are circled that were black band samples that look like black band um, that were collected in the winter, and they just have a distinct community. They, they don't seem to be a black band community. They just look like black band, or it's old black band. Um, and I do have a couple seawater um, uh, samples in there for comparison. So if we look at what are the dominant genera driving these changes, we can see um, that there's a big difference between what's in the black band and what's in the healthy. And this um, reinforces what has been seen um, with clone library studies and um, phylochips and things like that that have looked at black band versus healthy corals. Um, the healthy corals are dominated by Halomonas, and the black band are don't make, uh, dominated by that Roseophyllum filamentous cyanobacterium. And you can see that black band these six black band samples from the winter had a lot of this alpha proteobacterium and, and less of the roseophyllum. So there, there's something different going on in the winter. Um, but otherwise, there's a, a, a conserved consortium in black band, and then there's this healthy um, consortium. And I do want to also mention that this healthy sample includes, um, and sorry, all of these individual columns represent um, um, individual coral heads. And this is just looking at the top 10 genera. But there are lots of other things that are in these samples. Um, but these healthy samples include both entirely healthy coral heads and the healthy parts of corals that did have black band. 
So there doesn't seem to be this about half and half of those. So even the healthy parts on corals with black bands look like other healthy corals. So it's a very constrained um, community shift. That, that community shift in the black band is only at the black band layer. And we even did some um, small experiments. We looked at 5 centimeters away and 10 centimeters away and 15 centimeters away from the black band. And pretty much um, by cent 5 centimeters, it's almost completely looks like the healthy, cell, the, the healthy community again. So the big differences, roseophyllum is way more abundant in the black band, and halomonas is way more black, abundant in the healthy. But I do want to point out, despite the fact that this looks like um, almost completely white, roseophyllum was found at very low levels in every single healthy sample that I took. So it's, it's always there. Um, so just to pull out what's the black band consortium versus what's the healthy microbiome, this healthy microbiome is mostly that Halomonas and Moratella, and all of these are gamma proteobacteria. So this is a very stable, gamma proteobacterial rich, healthy microbiome. And in contrast, this roseophyllum, sorry, the black band um, consortium is mostly roseophyllum, um, but then it has disulfovibrio, which is a delta proteobacterium that's a known sulfate reducer. Um, because this roseophyllum, when it's creating this dense mat, it's creating anoxic and sulfitic un, um, environment underneath, and that's promoting that coral decay. The decay of the actual coral host is because it's suffocating it, and there's sulfide being produced, um, and so it's just you know not conducive to being a nice, healthy, living coral. And then we've got so besides the cyanobacterium and a delta proteobacteria, we've got a firmicutes, bacteroidetes, and alpha proteobacteria. So this consortium is very diverse. Um, compared to the healthy, stable microbiome. And here I want to show you some of examples from the tags. So that th those are the broad um, uh, patterns that we saw, but if you look at an individual tag over time, um, here I'm showing um, this tag 46 is a, actually a pretty large coral. Over here is some of the healthy part. You can see the black band over here and over here, and then there's that most of the top surfaces are covered with that turf that has moved in. Um, and I should point out that <laughs> when you go back to collect, there's, there are damselfish that vigorously defend their turf gardens, so they maintain these turf gardens on top of the dead corals, um, and they like to nip you when you're trying to take new samples. Um, but this is an example of what that winter black band looks like, an individual winter black band. It's dominated by alpha proteobacteria, and there's almost no roseophyllum in there at all, even though it looks like the black band. So either it's just the decaying pigment sitting around, or um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's something going on with those winter black band samples that are old black band. In contrast, here's a, some August, um, in 20, this most recent August, almost entirely roseophyllum. And of course, there's other minor members of the consortium. And then um, for the healthy microbiome, the healthy sample, and again, this is from, I'm not sure exactly where it was sampled, but from this coral, um, you know, an, an area that looks healthy, it's almost all Halomonas and Moratella, and then a couple other gammas. So black band is very different between winter and summer. The healthy community is very stable, so keep this picture in mind. And this is a different tag, and you see the healthy samples, whether it's winter, or summer um, look just like the other tag. So regardless of coral head and temporal um, sampling, the healthy microbiome is very stable. Um, but the black band, again, this is a, another black band. This is a summer black band, but it's different than the last summer black band. It's got a lot more of this bacteroidetes in it. So we have a variable black band community and a very stable healthy community. Um, so I also did a network analysis of these dominant genera um, to look for interactions. So I'm just showing negative interactions here, um, and this is looking for things, you can interpret a negative interaction as a, a mutual exclusion, so this might be indicating um, you know, competition or you, they occupy different niches, and I think in this case it has a lot to do with occupying different niches. Um, the halomonas has negative 
interactions with all five of those dominant members of the Black Band Consortium. Um, I'm not going to dwell on positive interactions too much, only to point out that the Roseophyllum had a single positive interaction with disulfovibrio. And that makes a lot of sense because that disulfovibrio is depending on roseophyllum to create that anoxic um, little niche that it can do the sulfate reduction in. Um, and this is, agrees with some recent work out of Lori Richardson's lab um, where they showed that if you infect um, corals with the roseophyllum or with a, a black band consortium sample, um, y you can um, inhibit the, infic the infection by stopping um, the sulfate reduction. So you can add this inhibitor of sulfate reduction, which is um, sodium molybdate, and you can stop the infection of black band. So there's some link between not only disulfovibrio needs that anoxic environment created by roseophyllum, but it seems to also be providing something to roseophyllum so that it can cause an infection. And again, you do still need to score the tissue of the coral to be able to cause these infections. So I'm going to segue into a little bit of the uh, metagenomic data I'm, I'm looking at <laughs> um, and talk about the role of nutrients in black band disease. And I'm, I'm going to do this from two different angles. So we know that on the coral reef, the, the waters that are surrounding the coral reef are very oligotrophic. Um, primary producers there are limited by um, mostly by um, nitrogen and phosphorus and iron. So I do have roseophyllum in culture and like other filamentous cy um, cyanobacterium, it cannot be cultured on its own. It can't be isolated completely. So I have these uni-algal but azenic cultures and you can see this clearly here. This is the roseophyllum filament. It has a it classi classically has this one tapered end and one blunt end. Um, this piece here I think is actually broken off. But then it has this whole suite of heterotrophic bacteria that live with it. Um, and I did not try to isolate this completely because I read some papers about um, growing filamentous cyanobacteria and basically there's something that those heterotrophs provide that it can't live without. So as long as there's only one cyanobacterium in there, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so what we know about this guy, you see there's stacks of cells inside this sheath. Um, they have gliding motility. We know they're photosynthetic and you can see their um, pigments autofluoresce under um, uh, epifluorescent microscope. Um, <clears throat> and when they're in culture, they adhere to the glass and they have these really cool little curly Q um, patterns that they just swirl around each other and, and stick to the glass. Um, but in addition to, to being photosynthetic, we also know that they can fix nitrogen. Um, and both of these processes, photosynthesis and nitrogen fixation, require lots of iron. Um, so iron might be a big part of um, this black band story, because that rosy phylum is always there. Um, but we don't know what triggers it to become a pathogen. And I would argue that it's also less like a pathogen, like a, a traditional pathogen, and more like a very localized um, harmful algal bloom. And remember I said that black band disease happens, um, you know, progresses faster and there's more commonly found in summer. Well, this also coincides with when um, dust from the Sahara is being delivered to the Caribbean. Um, so this has been proposed as, a, you know, a source of pathogens, um, but more importantly, I think, for the roseophyllum story is that it delivers a lot of iron. So that might be this iron seeding that's actually um, helping to trigger um, black band disease. It certainly doesn't hurt. So if we look at some of the metagenomic data from, um, I have four different black band metagenomes. I don't have a healthy metagenome, um, but in lieu of that I have um, a strain of Halomonas that was isolated from coral mucus. Um, and if we look at the general pattern here, look at iron acquisition genes, it's not really important what they are, but iron acquisition and transport genes within these black band metagenomes, there is a lot of variety of um, a variety and abundance of genes associated with iron transportation within the Bacteroides and Proteobacteria. 
And in contrast, cyanobacteria really just don't have a really large genetic repertoire for acquiring um, iron. And this really makes sense in light of their evolutionary history since they um, originated in an anoxic, iron-rich ocean and they didn't need to <laughs> have all these mechanisms to acquire iron. So um, <clears throat> when they do get iron, it's likely through siderophores and um, this may be part of the, the story why um, the roseophyllum is normally held in check, uh, but there's something about getting more iron in, in the summer that helps trigger black fan disease, along with um, increasing temperatures, <coughs> which would stress out the, the, the coral host. Um, but in addition to triggering, um, I, I thought we'd look at nitrogen just a, briefly. Um, as as a reason why night, why the rosy phylum can hang around, so we we know that these coral reefs are in oligotrophic um, environments, oligotrophic water, and any nitrogen that they have is going to be tightly cycled within that coral holobiont, and this is in between um, <clears throat> diazotrophs that are in both the coral tissue and in the surface mucus layer, and between the the symbiotic algae. Um, the dotted lines here indicate hypothetical transfers, and the solid lines are um, things that we know are experimentally demonstrated. So nitrogen fixation in the healthy microbiome um, is mostly performed by alpha proteobacteria, in particular rhizobia, and these are mostly within the tissue. There like, seems to be a distinct um, diazotroph community within the tissue of the um, coral host as compared to the, the surface microbiome, which is more like um, <clears throat> which has a more di diverse diazotroph community. So the healthy microbiome is providing some kind of nitrogen fixation. And again, remember that the zooxanthellae, they're primary producers, but they're mo limited mostly by the availability of nitrogen. Um, nitrogen fixation in the black band consortium is um, performed, potentially performed by all of these different groups. Um, I found NIF genes for all of these different phyla in classes, um, and most of those are the uh, groups that are in that dominant um, consortium. So I'm speculating that that roseophyllum can hang around because it does provide fixed nitrogen in this community, and so it's less likely to get um, expelled. So some of the take-home messages here: we have uh, the diseases in coral are or syndromes, and they're very complex and they're very contextual. So um, things that are always there may sometimes become pathogens and they're opportunistic, and they may be taking um, advantage of this dysbiosis, which is um, the normal microbiome is disrupted in some way, whether it's stress to the coral host um, or um, just something in the, in the environment that disrupts that normal, stable microbiome um, and allows these opportunistic pathogens to come in. Um, black band disease is caused by a diverse consortium. It's um, roseophyllum is um, has to be there, but it seems to require something else. It requires something from that heterotrophic community um, to allow it to thrive there and to to bloom. Um, and I see it as as a oops, I spelled roseophyllum wrong. Um, I see it as a habitat engineer. It's coming in and creating this anoxic. Um, little niche that um, helps speeds along the decay of the coral tissue. And I think that um, nutrients may be driving the formation of this black band disease, um, but also in, in the case of iron, um, but also for nitrogen, it might be facilitating the presence of roseophyllum as a disease reservoir. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and take questions. And I know I sped through that pretty quickly. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so get lots of time for questions. Thank you. Yeah, so we can um, bring everyone back in if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question if you're in the Hangout. Uh, we've got a bunch of folks online watching on YouTube, so please, if you have questions, tweet to microseminar or hashtag useminar. And, um, Julie, my first question is, where did you take that picture with the <laughs> hut that's floating over the 
water there. That's um, in Belize. That's the Smithsonian uh, Research Institution um, research station. Um, it's a, just a tiny little island. It's less than an acre. It has a, a research facility on it and great wow. coral reefs around it. <laughs> you want to stop screen sharing because I can see your... Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just watching myself. Oh. So meta to like, watch myself. Watch myself. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, but you know, totally the nicest pictures we've seen. I thought Mike Wilkins had a good uh, right full sight picture on his talk, but man, you just put them to shame. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the questions I had for you is in terms of your negative interaction plot, when you talked about the Halomonas and the um, the Rosio interactions, do you know if there's a the directionality of those interactions necessarily in terms of can the Halomonas keep the other things away, or is it just a numbers game in terms of they fill each other's niche. Well, with the halomonas, I think it can um, inhibit other proteobacteria, so like the things like the vibrios, and that because they are, can inhibit quorum sensing and um, produce these antibiotics that aren't going to uh, touch that that cyanobacterium because it doesn't have quorum sense. It doesn't use quorum sensing basically. Um, it's not really a strategy. It's most more of a proteobacterial story. But the the mucus itself that's sloughing off, I think, is is preventing the cyanos from um, okay. establishing because they've sh they've shown if you don't if you don't spore that tissue it, it can't establish it can't it can't seem to get in there and start black band disease hmm. curious. Um, so my other thought was since you're looking at them under the microscope and I agree with your filamentous cyanos are a pain in the butt to culture um, approach. <laughs> Do you see any? I mean, I know sometimes Begito have holdfasts. I thought some cyanobacteria had them too. Like, do you ever see any protrusions at the end of a filament that might give you a reason why scoring is important, or is it more of a nutrient thing? Um, they don't have anything that looks like a holdfast. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely have gliding motility. I can see them under the microscope sliding around. Um, but I think they're, I think they move around within that black band layer because they, there have been studies where this shows they do self shading. Like if it's too bright, they they move around and switch places within the the biofilm. Um, and there have been some SEM studies that show that these filaments can bore down into the coral skeleton. So I think they can actually hide out in the coral skeleton too. Do you have any experiments planned to do some inoculations with these with these cultures that you pulled out? Um, not directly to the coral hosts, but um, I am planning to do some experiments with like cold culturing different strains because I have I have isolated different strains of those heterotrophs. Um, okay. See, you know how they interact. Are you going to do any like little mini metagenomes of those of those 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 communities those artificial communities? Well, I have um, a metagenome from the enrichment. Okay. And it looks a lot like the black band sample with a lot more planktomycetes, but <laughs> um, other than that, it looks pretty much like the black band community. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was, I mean, is there any genomic information available to support some theories as to why these things can't be isolated? Well, um, might be, I mean, I've, I've thought about B12, and I know that it has at least some cobalamin synthesis genes. I haven't seen if they have the whole suite of them, but mm -hmm. it could be something as simple as that, as B12. So we yeah. got a question through the Twitter. So any indication that the roseophyllum produces secondary metabolites may be mediating the interaction? So... I guess going along with this idea of, of you know what are they missing any genomic components or that are necessary? Right. Um, well, they do produce secondary metabolites. Um, there is there's actually a big um, controversy of whether this black band consortium can produce something like a microcystin. And some groups say they do make microcystin, and some say they don't, which is a toxin um, that can kill off other bacteria and probably um, the host too, but we didn't detect any microcystin genes, and we didn't detect any 
microcystin um, in the products that it's making. Um, what it is making is um, a siderophore. So that seems to be, and it seems that these different um, filamentous cyanos, they each have like one or two particular products that they make a lot of. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, ask another one. Um, and I love the indication of Saharan dust because I always tell my students that, <laughs> that like, anytime they want to blame anything, just blame it on Saharan dust. That's what did we do before there was Sahara? <laughs> I know, I was just saying, like, the, the solution all these problems, problems, right, is just to vegetate Africa, but, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's see if any other questions come in. Um, Few more seconds to tweet any questions. If not, Julie is on Twitter as the former, uh, I guess, microbe of choice, right? The Libidomonas. Right. <laughs> and uh, oh, here's another question that just came in. How diverse are communities present in both the healthy and diseased corals? So, can you say it again? So in terms of the rarer communities, I guess it says, oh. how diverse are the rare microbial communities present in both the healthy and the disease? So is there any sort of rare biosphere effect of switching from Halomonas to Roseophyllum? I haven't looked at, like, I haven't closely looked at what changes in the rare biosphere, but there definitely is, um, there's, there isn't much of a difference between the overall richness of either sample, even though it seems like the consortium has um, a broader phylogenetic context. It's there are certainly as, as many taxa in the healthy microbiome. So, um, but I haven't looked to see if there's I mean, these minor members that might be, um, you know, actually making a difference in in this consortium. Cool. All right. Well, I think unless Cameron's got anything else to say, anything else to say? Well, thanks right. for the thanks for the wonderful talk, Julie. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Julie. And we will have a talk again in December, and it will actually be a little bit of a treat because it's by Eric Boyd, who actually avoids social media like the plague. So <laughs> we'll get him introduced to it. And thank you again, Julie, for doing this. And um, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you.